Okay, I will use this time to uh, introduce uh, Kamil Ugovil. Uh, Kamil Ugovil did his PhD with uh, uh, Richard Berzon at Columbia University, and uh, people from Tel Aviv University should know that Richard Berzon was honorary professor in our department, chemistry department of Tel Aviv University. And after uh, completing his PhD with uh, Richard Berzon, he came to Bob Schulman, and uh, this time uh, people were doing in vivo NMR, and he, he did a lot of in vivo NMR uh, in cells. And uh, at the same time, he developed with Truman Brown uh, the first chemical shift imaging. Uh, that's uh, one of his papers. And when he went to Minneapolis, he started from zero and really opened probably the best lab in the world with high field NMR. And the fact that he has such a, a good lab attracted very uh, good people, among them Sergio Gava, who uh, did the first uh, human experiment with uh, uh, Bold. And uh, for myself, when Itamar Ronen uh, developed the uh, uh, indirect detection of oxygen-17 to develop metabolic functional imaging of breathing oxygen and following the formation of water, uh, uh, when we want to do it in vivo, we didn't have any instrumentation, so we went to uh, Camille's lab and he did the experiment. On, uh, so, Camille, uh, you're welcome to speak. Thank you very much, Gil, uh, for the introduction. And uh, uh, it's really a great pleasure for me to be here uh, to uh, join the celebration, uh, Gil's 75th uh, birthday. I have to say, uh, unfortunately, I had uh, several uh, opportunities to come to Israel recently, which I somehow missed one way or the other. But uh, I decided that this one I cannot miss, given the fact that Really, as you've heard from Seiji and others from Gil, that uh, my interactions with uh, Gil uh, goes quite a long way. Well, you've heard already that uh, I've, I've met Gil uh, when I was at Bell Labs, when I just started after my PhD at Bell Labs in Bob Schumann's uh, uh, lab, which has brought so many of us uh, together. And Gil had been a postdoc and had gone on uh, before I came to Bell Labs. But he came to visit, and uh, when I was at Bell Labs, uh, we, in fact, uh, overlapped for quite a while. I searched to see if he had actually published anything from that time. We didn't. And there's a review article that we are co-authors on, but we didn't publish. And we don't even have a photograph of, of uh, us in Bell Labs together. And I also commented on the fact that Seiji and I also don't have a photograph from our Bell Labs days. But uh, I do have this photograph, which I decided to show. It is Bob Schulman. You've seen him uh, lecture. And uh, behind, uh, right next to Bob, uh, right here, that's me, if you can recognize it, actually. And you can see that Bob never changes. I I've changed a lot. But... And uh, um, OK, Bob has gone gray, and so have I. So uh, we... that's Truman Brown, and Truman Brown. And uh, in those days, uh, as you've heard also, that uh, we have been working on cell suspensions. This is actually uh, one of the uh, spectra. This is uh, from one of my papers looking at uh, E. coli cells. And uh, I have to say, uh, I have really much nicer spectra than Gil and Seiji got uh, because of the fact that I solved this minor problem uh, with a somewhat better success of getting oxygen into a very, very dense, dense pack of E. coli cells. You know, if you want, I can tell you my secret afterwards. But. So uh, we worked on that, but, uh, you know, Gil was also working on that together. But my interaction with Gil really came uh, uh, much, I mean, uh, much more, as Gil had uh, mentioned, after functional imaging. And uh, you know that in functional imaging, we are, became all aware of the fact that uh, when you have a neuronal activity, you have increase in regional blood flow. And, uh, but the oxygen uh, consumption doesn't go up uh, as much, and uh, there you have a lower deoxyhemoglobin content and essentially a change in the bold contrast. But we were very, everybody became, in fact, as a result of functional imaging, this uh, uh, idea of blood flow changes and oxygen consumption changes 
And the pet people had said that oxygen consumption doesn't change very much in the brain with uh, activation. In fact, changes almost nothing. But of course, we didn't really quite believe them uh, in those days. And Gill had the idea that he wanted to do, uh, in fact, uh, a new functional imaging methodology based on oxygen-17 and measuring oxygen consumption. So uh, as he had mentioned, Itamar came to our lab, and then later Gill came to uh, a lab and spent a uh, one-year sabbatical. And the idea was uh, to, use, uh, um, uh, to measure CMRO2 and to use this as a new functional imaging modality. It would be much more quantitative. You would be measuring oxygen consumption change. And of course, Gill likes to do things in a certain way. He always likes indirect detection. And he wanted to look at the proton of the water bound to the O17. And he had a wonderful idea based on the um, T2 of uh, the proton that is bound to the oxygen 17. And, and we did publish some work uh, together. That was uh, the, one of the, the first paper. And uh, I couldn't figure out what we did in this paper, actually. But I think maybe we came up uh, with the pulse sequence. I, I don't know. But the second paper uh, uh, was uh, done in, in Minneapolis by Itamar, showing that we actually um, can detect this uh, protons, as Gill had uh, postulated, uh, through the interaction uh, with the oxygen-17. So it was detecting oxygen-17 in, uh, in the proton and MR spectrum. Now, this did not really develop. Uh, we continued uh, on this. It did not develop into a, a method for functional imaging because of this actually, which I'm going to talk about later. And here, what you are looking at, these are uh, uh, traces of um, proton intensity, proton intensity in the brain uh, at different parts of the brain. Uh, and you can see that this is a time series, so you're acquiring one image after another one, and you are looking at the intensity of the, uh, of the, of the water as a function of time. And it, it fluctuates a lot. It fluctuates a lot. It's consciousness, actually, which I will get to later on. And uh, interestingly, of course, the amplitude of the fluctuations is proportional to the signal amplitude. So you think that you have a lot of signal to noise and a big signal when you go to proton detection uh, of oxygen-17. And, and, and that is so true. But if you want to do a temporal measurement, like if you want to measure CMRO2, you have to measure one image after another. You have to worry about temporal uh, signal to noise. And that temporal signal-to-noise is not the signal-to-noise of the single image. And uh, Wei Chen and uh, Xiao Hansu in our lab that Gill started in 017 really tried very hard to take this method that Gill seeded. By the way, my view of Gill is often that he travels around every once in a while and goes to this lab or that lab, drops some idea, and then disappears, and then some... Uh, uh, incredible work that comes out with the seed that, uh, that Gill plants. So we continued with the seed that Gill uh, planted. But uh, we, uh, Wei Chen and Xiao Han gave up on the, uh, the proton detection because of that problem, it's because, uh, because of these fluctuations, and in fact uh, decided to go the direct route of uh, looking at O17. And interestingly, I was just thinking about this as I was coming and thinking about this lecture. The reason O17 direct detection worked is because it has very large line widths, and it's insensitive to bolt, more or less. So it is not, in fact, sensitive to all those fluctuations in the brain, which through the bolt mechanism ends up in the fluctuations in the water resonance in the brain. And of course, uh, for a variety of reasons, mainly for functional imaging, as I will tell you, we are very much interested in high fields. We pushed high fields very hard in uh, Minnesota. And O17 was, uh, direct detection was perfect uh, for high fields. These are sensitivities measured for O17 as a function of field strength. It goes almost uh, you know, the, you know, uh, as the squared of the magnetic field, uh, uh, approximately, I mean, the theoretical limit of 7.4 or experimental, uh, with an experimental er error about the square of the magnetic field. It's ideal for high fields. And uh, um, so Wei Chen continued on this. There has been several papers, uh, maybe about uh, a hand, you know, 10 or 12 papers coming out. But essentially, the Gill's idea that he came to Minnesota for doing functional imaging with O17 was, in fact, realized by uh, Wei Chen and Xiao Huan Su, but uh, not with indirect detection, Gill. I'm sorry. Uh, it was with direct detection. And these are functional images in the cat cortex, 
looking at CMRO2 measurements. So you are measuring, uh, uh, here's the anatomy, here's the fractional change in the oxygen consumption. It's a quantitative measure. There's a number to that, as well as the basal oxygen consumption. And then here's the bold effect, comparing the functional image with bold and uh, with, uh, with um, uh, O17. And here's another cat, very similar results. So even though this is not necessarily a, a functional imaging modality in, uh, that is used uh, routinely, on the other hand, it has proven to be a very important tool in trying to understand the energetics. In fact, Bob Schulman alluded to that. Uh, because uh, in, uh, in functional imaging, we, we are looking at energetic uh, issues, and understanding energetics is very important. And in fact, uh, one of the issues have been what is the oxygen consumption cost of uh, incremental uh, change in the activity uh, of the brain? And uh, Xiaohan and uh, Wei Chen, was in, this is the same paper, uh, was able to in fact measure that using O17. And these are um, uh, measurements, and they measured approximately 33% uh, increase in oxygen consumption. So not what the pet people had measured, which was almost zero in the human brain, but 33%, uh, and there's much more or less consensus now about uh, this kind of a, approximately this kind of a number for oxygen consumption change. But they had, uh, interestingly, they had uh, found something else, because I, I didn't talk about it very much, but when you actually activate uh, the visual cortex, you get activity increases uh, in the, some part of the visual cortex, uh, primary areas. In the periphery, you get actually decreases in neuronal activity as well as oxygen consumption. We later on show that in the humans, and my postdoc later on showed that in uh, monkeys with electro electrophysiology as well. Another postdoc from Israel, actually, Amir Shmuel, showed that uh, with electrophysiology in monkeys as well. But in this paper, what was interesting is that when they took in uh, the, all of the visual cortex, including negative and the positive areas, then the oxygen consumption change was much less, probably explaining the results um, in the early pet literature. Now, my, uh, even though this effort did not go into become a, import, you know, a, a functional imaging modality, as I'd mentioned, it had these in interesting uh, effects, but uh, we continue to do a lot of work with BOLD uh, in, uh, with respect to oxygen, uh, uh, with respect to brain function. Now, this is from the, uh, the first paper that, uh, uh, that was done uh, in my lab uh, with Seiji. And uh, you've seen two images from that. This is another one, one of the published images. Uh, and yeah, this is the paper that was rejected. And I actually suggested to uh, Seiji at that time that we shouldn't submit it to nature and science. Uh, you can publish this anywhere that it will get noticed. And we got delayed, actually, because of the fact that we were rejected uh, twice and we ended up in uh, PNAS. And, uh, yeah, the nature people send us a letter saying that uh, they didn't think that this would be of general interest. <laughs> so, but what is really interesting about this image um, is that unlike uh, functional images, even, even to this day published b by many labs, this very, you know, this very first functional image from four Tesla, this was four Tesla, we actually were talking about doing functional images, Seiji uh, and I, for quite a while, and we were waiting for this magnet to be operational, and when the magnet became operational, that was the first experiment uh, done on that magnet. Of course, as Seiji had mentioned, we had to solve a lot of problems uh, because it was a totally new system for the first time working at high fields, etc. But what was imp uh, really impressive about this image is the fact that how the, um, the activity really follows the gray matter uh, contours. And uh, this has been really uh, an effort then in our lab to uh, get this kind of imaging in the, whole, in the whole brain, which I want to tell you about. And the reason is uh, why that is an important consideration is that the bold effect, as you know, is really deoxyhemoglobin effect, and it's as such mediated by vasculature. So vasculature means that there are many vessels that contain deoxyhemoglobin, there are cap capillaries where the deoxyhemoglobin is generated, but that is then carried into the surface, onto the surface of the uh, brain by penetrating blood vessels like this, and then it uh, exists on the blood vessels on the surface of the brain, the large blood vessels. And as such, the vasculature imposes uh, essentially a spatial, um, uh, uh, a spatial accuracy onto the functional images, 
And we ideally would like to detect the capillaries, but uh, the largest signals uh, come from the uh, big vessels that, want, that don't have the uh, accuracy. And it turns out, and I'll show you a slide uh, demonstrating that, and we realized this from early, very early on with models that uh, we and others had uh, published, that uh, high fields, going to high fields, sh uh, actually shifts the functional images more to the capillaries, and you can even think about procedures where you can suppress these vessels completely. So that's, this is just an example of that, just from a recent paper uh, published uh, um, uh, uh, by Camille Uluda and, um, and uh, uh, modeling that you know, Seiji had done, but this was sort of a more uh, complete model extending it to a larger way. And I don't want to go too much into the detail, but essentially you can look at this uh, vertical axis here as the ratio of contributions coming from small vessels versus large vessels. So five uh, you know, uh, mic micron diameter versus, versus 60, or five micron diameter vessels versus 100 micron diameter vessels. And uh, you can see that um, this is, uh, you can think of this as the magnetic field increasing, and uh, it increases, but ultimately it does level off. But you, if instead of working one and a half Tesla at that time, we were working at four Tesla, and going to seven Tesla and uh, even to higher fields, there are some gains. So if you were to look at a, a functional image at one and a half Tesla with very high resolution, and this is a slide uh, I took from Mark Heike, you would see something like this, where you, you see this is a visual stimulation. You should have a rather large activity on the gray matter, but in this very high resolution image, you see these narrow lines uh, com coming right on the, uh, in the sal side. So this is where the big vessels are. So you are sensitive in this uh, low field image to uh, big vessels. And of course, typically people don't see this in, at low field because they, they actually don't obtain the images with such high resolution. They obtain them with very low resolution. And because of that low resolution, that very small line then spreads and appears like a, like a blob. But this is what you would see at... Uh, where is that? It didn't show. Uh, and this is what you would see actually at seven Tesla with the same, uh, same resolution. So not only the big vessels, but these large uh, uh, diffuse activity from the capillary comes in. And uh, I don't have time to go into it, but you can do spin echoes to suppress those uh, large vessels. Spin echoes don't work at uh, lower fields, but fields like seven Tesla give you these uh, very diffuse images. So what, uh, what has this done uh, for us then in terms of understanding brain function? Well, what it has done is that it has taken us from functional images like this of, in this case, an example of visual cortex stimulation to imaging uh, cortical columns. And this has been something that we have been trying to get to from the very early days uh, of functional imaging. And the development of high fields more or less uh, in, uh, happened because of this drive in our lab uh, pushing to get to columnar resolutions. There are many examples of cortical columns, and a very well-known example is the ocular dominance columns uh, here, where the uh, output from each eye is segregated in the lateral geniculate nucleus here, and then subsequently gets uh, uh, segregated in the primary visual cortex into a structure like this. Looks like a fingerprint on the cortical surface, but different uh, set of neurons uh, actually process uh, one eye or the other one. Superimposed on that are uh, the uh, orientation domains, um, uh, which resulted in a Nobel Prize when they were discovered uh, by Hubel and Wiesel. And these are uh, 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 areas in the visual cortex that respond to different uh, lines of different uh, orientations. But actually, it, this is not just for visual cortex. There are from monkey studies, for example, there are higher order uh, areas that are thought to be organized in columnar structure. And uh, in this case from Tanaka's lab, uh, where the monkey is looking at shapes versus uh, faces, etc., and there's a columnar organization. So this actually can be a very general uh, organizing principle in the, uh, in, the visual, uh, in the human brain. And they can be regarded as uh, the simplest uh, uh, or the most elementary computational units. And so, I think that from uh, the point of view of understanding brain function, this is uh, where we had to go. Now, for in the cognitive neuroscience community, for I think uh, many years, for human cognitive neuroscience community, I think all of this effort that we have done in columnar uh, Im imaging 
was not necessarily of great interest because of the fact that the people who are asking cognitive questions about the human brain function were really asking questions not at that level. It was not a level that was available to them. Uh, they were perfectly happy with one centimeter resolution in the human brain because the kinds of questions they were asking simply uh, could not uh, deal with uh, the kind of resolution that imaging was providing. But this is really changing uh, very rapidly as, as we speak right now. And ideally, of course, we are looking to actually bridge this uh, uh, gap between input and behavior and neuronal activity. And uh, there has uh, been an, uh, you know, more and more efforts now based on uh, imaging that actually uh, are providing a connection. A very popular, I won't be able to go into it very much, uh, effort is based on decoding. You, this is, these are based on uh, machine lear learning algorithms and uh, it's um, uh, based on classification and they're model free and uh, they try to interpret uh, the, I mean, they try to predict essentially from the brain activity what uh, the perception or behavior would be. Probably much more interesting and certainly to me is uh, these encoding models and uh, you can look at it as a brain reading but uh, with a neuronal model. So you have to have a neural model linking the uh, behavior with activity and of course when you talk about neural model then you really have to start putting into your model essentially what the brain is doing and brain certainly is processing in information at the col columnar level and that kind of information has to get into that model and it's becoming actually quite obvious uh, as this kind of work is right now going on that this is uh, going to be a very important application in terms of understanding brain function. So. I showed you uh, the ocular dominance columns. They were uh, successfully uh, mapped uh, by us at 7 Tesla. This is a, uh, from our publication in PNAS. And essentially, we are looking at a very flat part of the cortex. It's a single slice experiment because in a flat part of the early visual area, V1, you can actually see, uh, you can expect how, what you want to see. Uh, that, that is, the uh, ocular dominance columns have to be running perpendicular to the interhemispheric fissure. They have to have a certain pattern, and uh, it is actually shown over here. And if you go to this paper, you will also see a lot of uh, experiments demonstrating that they are extremely reproducible. And subsequently, we showed that in the same subject, we can uh, map the uh, orientation domains, and that was also, uh, I'm sorry, this was a neuroimage paper and the other image was in PNAS, published a little later. In the same subject, we're mapping uh, both ocular dominance and the orientation domains, which brought us, in fact, to where uh, animal uh, uh, neuroscience uh, was at that level. So optical imaging, many groups, um, uh, had shown that you can obtain these uh, um, orientation domains with optical imaging and ocular dominance uh, um, columns. These are the ocular dominance boundaries. These are the orientation domains. But this is an invasive procedure. I mean, you have to open a hole in the skull, and you can only see a very small area. You cannot do it in the whole brain. But uh, essentially, um, we are now at a point where we can obtain the same kind of imaging in the human brain without having to open the skull, and of course with the capability of doing this in the, in the whole brain. So these are uh, well-known uh, structures. We use them as model systems to demonstrate that we can obtain them, but uh, recently we have extended them to, for example, uh, the area MT. This is uh, uh, work in collaboration with our colleagues in Maastricht. And area MT uh, is supposed to have orientation uh, motion direction columns. Uh, essentially, you have a stimulus like this. You know, these are direction of motion. And uh, MT is a very small area. You have to, you can actually do some functional imaging uh, to identify where it is. You can see it right here um, on the banks of this uh, particular sulcus. And uh, we can, uh, we, these are now three-dimensional high-resolution images, 0.8 millimeter isotropic. We can segment the uh, cortex into different layers, uh, not only uh, see on the cortical surface, but in fact we can obtain images as a function of the depth of the cortical surface. So these are MT, motion of direction columns, uh, uh, along this, you know, this is the top layer, uh, middle layer, and somewhere in the bottom, and this is another representation of it uh, looking at the depth of the layers versus on the cortical surface.
So ma magnetic resonance at high fields is really, uh, at this point, able to uh, ex access these uh, columnar organizations. These are, by the way, the tuning curves, if you like, how each of those particular uh, columns are tuned in terms of their specificity to the direction uh, of the motion. Another example, just recently uh, yet uh, unpublished, is uh, the, um, uh, in, in the inferior colliculus uh, tonotopic mapping right here, a very small structure and tonotopic mapping in the inferior uh, colliculus. Now, so we are essentially uh, at a point where we can feed that information to this uh, encoding brain models, and this is work uh, that is going on. But in order to really accomplish this, we have to go from just being able to look at these columns per se, but look at the whole brain in a, uh, with this resolution to see the columnar structure. So we can accomplish this. There has been a lot of development in hardware and uh, sequences. These are some of the uh, recent EPI images from uh, uh, 7 Tesla, very high resolution. And when we started at 4 Tesla, uh, when uh, you know, nobody could believe that one could do EPI at high fields, but uh, with the development of parallel imaging and other techniques, essentially the EPI imaging, and as well as hardware, you know, uh, very fast gradients, EPI images uh, at 7 Tesla now uh, really look superb. The only problem is when we want to do that kind of resolution, it still takes too long for functional images. For example, the TR is here six seconds, and for functional imaging, is, that is actually long. We have to go to much, much faster uh, acquisition times, whole brain. So we tackled that problem, and uh, this is uh, from work that uh, was presented uh, uh, at ISMRM in 2008 and then published uh, at the very beginning of 2010, showing that we can do functional imaging with very fast acquisition. This is 88 slices. Now, instead of six seconds, uh, we're down to uh, 1.25 seconds. And the technique is uh, based on uh, acquiring multiple slices at the same time. So, uh, and, uh, so essentially, what you do is, instead of taking single slice images, one after another, you s excite simultaneously, and this is easy to do with the appropriate RF pulses, and uh, you can excite simultaneously multiple slices. So, for example, in this case, an example is shown with four slices. So you then step through four slices at a time uh, to, cover the, to cover the whole brain. And uh, you uh, then have to somehow, of course, uh, unwrap those uh, slices. So we've got four slices excited at the same time. The images come together. They are a sum of those images, and we have to untangle them. And we use parallel uh, imaging principles for that. So you have to use uh, a lot of coils to detect it. So for example, if you were to look at uh, four slices excited like this, that particular slice is uh, best detected by these coils and uh, this particular slice is best detected uh, by these coils over here. So you can actually uh, uh, use the coil sensitivities and you end up with a matrix inversion and then you can actually uh, untangle all those simultaneously excited slices. So this is uh, where we are uh, with this technology. So, uh, this is unpublished work right now. MB stands for multiband and it, it tells you how many slices you excite at the same time. And you can see that uh, this is with a 32-channel coil. Sorry, you can see that, uh, for example, even eight slices at the same time gives you very good uh, high-quality images. The first row is MB1. That's the product EPI. And uh, MB12 is starting to, uh, to break down. And we have measures of, actually, the leakage, et cetera, which I won't go into. But, uh, for example, with a 32-channel coil, uh, you can do something like MB8. And the kind of whole brain images is an example. This is uh, multiband six, so six slices excited at the same time, uh, showing that you can do whole brain at this kind of speed. And the speed gains can be quite uh, dramatic. For example, if we are talking about uh, two millimeter resolution, it would take us normally two and a half seconds to acquire that whole image, but uh, we can cut that uh, time down and all the way, if you're to talking about something like MB8, to uh, uh, 0.3 seconds, so approximately you know, eight-fold or so at the present time with a 32-channel coil. If you go to one millimeter, again, now you're talking about three and a half seconds to four seconds, and then down to 0.4 seconds. These are whole brain isotropic resolution uh, 
uh, EPI images, and they have a huge impact on functional imaging and uh, connectivity measurements. I'll just talk about the resting state, uh, this particular plot that I told you about. This was actually uh, obtained with one of those uh, sequences, and, um, um, and essentially, as uh, um, uh, Bob has talked about, uh, there is a lot of energy uh, consumption going on in the brain, uh, during uh, when you're not even doing a specific task you are when you say resting you're just resting doing nothing in a magnet and uh, In a sense you can say this is uh, your consciousness that you are monitoring uh, with functional imaging now as opposed to uh, um, As opposed to oxygen consumption those signals are indeed brain signals They have been shown in fact to contain information about functionally related networks but with these very fast sequences we can, in fact, obtain a temporal dynamics of those, of those networks. So you may have in, uh, in the brain, for example, several places, somehow in those uh, fluctuating, spontaneously fluctuating signals, they are correlated. So they are going up and down in their uh, imaging signal simultaneously together, and they have a correlated. And you can think of this as, as a network in the brain. Somehow their activity is correlated because they are doing something at the same time together. Now, but we know that networks cannot be static in the brain. You know, uh, they have to be changing in time because of the fact that the brain has to uh, deal with dynamic processes. And with these very fast acquisitions, we were asking the question, in fact, can we identify a networks that are uh, changing in time, but they have some sort of a consistency? So um, you may have, for example, a network uh, like this, two areas activated together at the same time, and you may call this a, uh, give it a name, and you may have another one like this um, activated some of the times together, and then you may have some of the time uh, these, two, uh, these areas now working together actually to, to do a different process. And uh, these very fast acquisitions of resting state in fact, has enabled us to define these transient functional modes. That's the latest version, uh, the name that we have given them. And I want to just show you a movie uh, of that. And this movie is running uh, six times faster than uh, normal. And uh, if I can get that. Uh, six times normal than uh, normal. Essentially, uh, what you are seeing is that these uh, areas that appear the same color, those areas are actually, for a period of time, have correlated uh, activity. But they don't last forever, obviously. Uh, they come and they go, and different areas are uh, showing this kind of a correlate behavior. And interestingly, these patterns are reproducible uh, from an, in the same subject, but reproducible between subject to subject. In other words, if you take a group of five groups, you know, group of five individuals, another group of five individuals, you can actually recognize the same kind of clusters that seem to uh, uh, operate. These are independent uh, component analysis. They are performed by uh, Steve Smith, our collaborator on that project, and uh, uh, um, uh, essentially a result of the, I'm finishing, you know, a result of this uh, fast acquisition. These fast acquisitions, I thought I would just put uh, two slides, I won't talk about it very much, uh, because you will hear about, but they have a huge impact on this kind of uh, tractography because we can acquire, instead of taking uh, 40 minutes normally, you would take to acquire an image like this, uh, we can do it in about uh, eight uh, minutes, and this is a seven Tesla example, again, enabled by this kind of an acquisition. So. All of the work that I presented to you comes from Minnesota and uh, maybe unknown to you in Israel, but uh, Gil even spent the whole winter suffering this cold uh, where we started the oxygen uh, measurement. And finally, um, happy birthday, Gil, and many happy returns of the day. for the resting state uh, MRI, uh, if you measure bold, so if it's a 0.2 second or 0.4 second, why it, so it matters? 
So the bold response in principle is uh, uh, relatively slow and uh, the movie that I showed you was obtained with uh, 0.8 seconds and it's a very interesting question actually whether you will gain something if you go to even faster. I, I mean I, you can imagine 0.8 seconds uh, is still you know in the in the ballpark where uh, you can you can it can help uh, di distinguish processes. So it's a very good question. We are looking into that. So it's not also it's possible that uh, we will not gain any more when you go faster in terms of uh, bold, but we may gain uh, uh, statistical significance and things like that. Uh, you know, essentially temporal signal to noise. So, but at 0.8 seconds, you do have additional information compared to two and a half seconds or um, three seconds, which normally you would it, you, it would take you to to do. Additionally, the, these temporal uh, networks, uh, as far as I know, uh, a longer time, a more consistent network were shown to be related to neural activity. The temporal ones are not clear what they are, actually. Do you have any idea? We don't know exactly what they are, and their biological significance is uh, 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 interesting, but essentially they depict still temporarily certain functional relationships. And there are many, um, uh, I mean, there are many, no, uh, many modes that you can identify. And interestingly, one of them, for example, turns out to be, I had talked about how in the visual cortex, when you, uh, when you excite the visual cortex, uh, surrounding areas in the cortex tends to get negative responses. They always seem to be working in this anti-correlated fashion. And we find the same thing in these uh, temporal networks. And there are other uh, areas, so-called, for example, default mode network. In terms of this temporal analysis, it breaks down to subsections that you can actually identify. So all the biological significance is not clear. I mean, we don't even know what the default mode networks does, other than we know that it gets deactivated when other activity is taking place. But uh, uh, but I would I would think that uh, uh, they, in my opinion, in fact. I think that they probably will end up having a significant uh, importance in, in terms of brain function. And Jerry asked, how does the brain work after all? And uh, you know, my, my, my uh, picture of how does the brain work is that the input that the brain takes is actually is very minimal. Uh, we know, for example, from uh, vision people that the optical information you get from the retina is really quite small compared to pictures that we generate. So the brain has incredible number of models that it has to sample and match with the input that is coming on. And, uh, and I think that we may be seeing essentially sampling of those uh, models in these networks, which requires a lot of oxygen consumption. <laughs>